to the late 1800s. The arts and crafts movement is at the height of its fame and a group of men and women are busy rewriting the rule books of design and architecture. They wanted to make everyday objects beautiful and they left an impact on British design we still feel today. But make no mistake, this was about so much more than pretty wallpaper and embroidered cushions. These artists, architects and political thinkers were starting a revolution. Inspired by art critic John Ruskin and socialist designer William Morris, they hated the drudgery and ugliness of the industrial age. They wanted to turn the clock back to an age where a craft worker's skills were valued. These were principles, not just for design, but for life. Bring joy to work, share knowledge, and make beauty accessible to all. From the 1880s to the 1920s, they spread their radical message across Britain. Art could help to end social inequality. Which is a great idea, if you can make it work. To find out what we can learn from the arts and crafts movement, six 21st century craftspeople are heading back to the world of the 19th. The crafters are going back to basics. They won't find computer-aided design or power tools here. In real life, we wouldn't be worried about it. We just put the machine, <laughs> we'll go. Now they're spending a month together in a Victorian artist's commune. We're going to be up early, we're going to be in late. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. They'll be living the arts and crafts dream. Simplicity, fellowship, Thank you. and taking joy in work as they remake this stunning house room by room, without tears or tantrums. You start off all being very nicey-nicey. As the pressure builds up, it's really hard to hide the real you. Can they recreate the beautiful objects and high ideals of the arts and crafts movement by hand? Oh. And will recapturing the spirit of the past bring fresh creativity to the crafts of the present? The crafters have been living and working together for two weeks. They've begun to relearn the skills of the 1890s artisans, rediscovering the tools and techniques at the heart of the arts and crafts movement. <laughs> Transforming the parlour with product designer Ilsa Parry's beautiful William Morris-inspired wallpaper. And the bedroom, where embroiderer Neve Wimpress created the judge's favourite item, an elegant bedspread. But with six strong personalities thrown together, creative tension is inevitable. That's it, that's the problem. But at the end of last week, they seem to find a new spirit of harmony. <laughs> but will it last? <laughs> this week, the crafters are creating objects for a room the Victorians saw as the place to make a grand statement, the dining room. Our expert judges, Keith Brimer-Jones and Patch Rogers, want the crafters to create a space of simple sophistication. At the end of the week, they'll choose an object that best captures the spirit of the arts and crafts movement. Its designers kicked out the fussiness of Victorian dining rooms in favour of a more minimal approach. Can our crafters do the same? Hello, everybody. Isn't this an amazing room? So the only solo build this week, and the last solo build, full stop, is going to you, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rod, the first task of this week is to make a beautiful set of fire dogs. It's a very complicated piece. So it's going to be the elements that you pull from that piece that I'm going to be looking for. Fire dogs are the iron brackets which hold logs in place as they burn on an open fire. Designed by Ernest Jimpson, this complex piece features detailing inspired by the 17th century. Jimpson was heavily influenced by nature and the brasswork is based on a classic English flower, the carnation. 
your eyebrows have gone <laughs> higher, higher up your forehead, but your eyes have lit up. What do you think? <laughs> I think it's, um, it's a big project, but it gives you such a lot of scope for some uh, huge amounts of <clears throat> huge amount of creativity. Well, and why is that making you emotional? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's the idea that you're about to create something that could have such big meaning, or? I, um, <clears throat> I think it's... Yeah, come on, give him a hug. <laughs> come on, <okay. laughs> no, so on to our first pair. And that's going to be the girls, Bryony and Neve. You're working together this week. What have you got, boys? Well, it's curtains for you guys. <laughs> no, it really is. <laughs> we want you to produce curtains for the entire room with this wonderfully Walter Crane-inspired design. Walter Crane is best known for his beautiful illustrations for children's fairy tales but he considered his political art to be far more important. Crane viewed art as a tool that could change society for the better. He was also passionate about textiles, his designs often medieval in style. For Crane, this was a more honest era when artists were craftsmen and craftsmen were artists. If you take it as a design and then bring your own thing to that, that will be fantastic never done anything like this before. <laughs> but you can get into the mind of a, of a socialist designer, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Bryony, I mean, this isn't your area, is it? No, but I would love to do more learning this week and um, to actually maybe step away from metalwork and actually learn more things myself, so it's perfect. And so the second pairing, that is Stephen and Ilse. Let's see what we've got. So the third and final task is this wonderful... William de Morgan plate, actually a tondino, that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, are you happy? Absolutely. <laughs> Over the last two weeks, Stephen's had to embrace new skills. Now, finally, he has a challenge which involves his passion, pottery. This new challenge suits product designer Ilsa too. And there is going to produce yeah. fantastic finished crockery. We have a lot of similar ideas and we can bounce things back and forward, so I think we'll come up with something special. We want you to produce a set of tondinos using white earthenware that he used at the time and creating your own interpretation of design on the plates. William de Morgan's lustres and glazes broke new ground in pottery. His designs invoke the brilliant colours of Islamic art and feature fantastical birds and animals, giving his plates a rich, otherworldly quality. It's a more of a symbolic item than an item that you would use for everyday use. Those elements within that, you've got swans, you've got fish, you've got a starfish in the middle. You know, it's alluding to the sea, it's alluding to travel, possibly. You know, it's those elements that I want you to concentrate on and try and find and interpret for yourself. Abby, you'll be the project leader. Well, so there you have it. You know your tasks for the next week. You've only got a week to produce them. And, of course, this is more about your collaborative effort now. It's about stepping out of your comfort zone and it's about sharing your expertise and learning from each other. I cannot wait to see what you produce. Good luck to all of you. At the end of the week, Keith and Patch will choose which creation best represents the arts and crafts movement. In the library, the crafters can learn from its masters. They were meticulous in recording their working practices as well as their political ideology. Being able to research the writings and designs of Jimson, Crane and De Morgan will give our crafters invaluable insights into the tasks that lay ahead. Whoa, that's a thick one. <laughs> Hopes and fears for us. Over the last two weeks, the crafters have gradually become a more collaborative unit. They've put in long hours as they strive to live up to the ideals of the arts and crafts pioneers. We're all exhausted and we're trying to keep going with the energy, but you know, you can see in the evenings that people are just like, flagging and <laughs> falling asleep where they're sitting. So it's been hard work. Could this be the week we walk into a room with unfinished items? 
It could be. I mean, you know, the fire dogs worry me a little bit. I mean, you're a bit worried about the, the plates and getting them done. I'm worried about Stephen's use of time, whether he, he uses the time correctly in order to get those plates made. And let's not forget the curtains. There's a lot of material there. There's a lot of material. For Potter, Stephen Wynne Stanley and product designer Ilsa Parry, it's their first time working together as a team. Sink finish. <laughs> what I like most about being around Stephen is that he's fun. He is also keen to convey ideas. So I think it will be a really good collaboration. I'm excited. Oh, plans now. We're getting plans now. Plans for plates. <laughs> the elements of the designs that Will, uh, William de Morgan did that make it instantly recognisable as yeah. one of his pieces. Cool. We can build that into how but we stylize. But then you just look a little bit closer. Yeah. And when where he had a starfish, yeah. we've got something, something modern. Yeah. Ilsa will come up with a design concept. Stephen will make the plates using traditional techniques. Just trying to get my head around the kick wheel, because I've never used one. It's quite different. I like it, though, because it's quiet. At home, Stephen's used to an electric potter's wheel. So going back to arts and crafts methods, it's a challenge. The odds are stacked against you. It's like a rodeo. It's like you just kind of get on and you give it a shot and then if you can do it, then you just want to go on and do it again. Over the last two weeks, bladesmith Rod Hughes has been put in harness with other crafters. And at times he's found collaborating with them a frustrating experience. This week, he's on his own. I'm looking forward to the glory of making something as creative as a set of Gibson dogs. It's nice, I've got complete um, autonomy on, on my designs and I'm the only person that I have to rely on. I've got no one to blame but myself. Neve Wimpress is an embroiderer, Bryony Knox is a silversmith. Hello. Curtains aren't on either of their CVs. It's slightly daunting because we don't know the process at all, but yeah. in a way the good thing is it means we're both on exactly the same page. Brilliant. And, uh, yeah. So that's not, not a can't go, can't, yeah, <laughs> can't go wrong, it can only be up from here. Yeah. This project will give them the chance to get to grips with the radical politics of the arts and crafts movement. Are you sort of thinking about design at the moment? I think I'm planning on reading some sort of socialist poetry and seeing what images we can pull from that. Okay. Because they kept on saying, you know, that, that he was a socialist, so... Yeah, seeing what political elements we can, we can put into it. I'm really excited to be working with Neve. Secretly, I was hoping to do something that wasn't metal at all and to learn something, so my wishes have come true. <laughs> Brian is going to be on the kind of technical side, working out what things are. I'm going to be having a look through political poems from the time to try and draw some imagery. The creative juices are flowing. The hard graft of actually making will start tomorrow. Good morning, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. For wealthy Victorian families, breakfast was a substantial, hearty affair. Our crafters certainly aren't going to go hungry. Now this is kedgeri, but it's a different recipe. It's actually called Florence Nightingale's kedgeri. Ooh, right bread. I haven't had that since I was a kid. <laughs> In previous weeks, Abby has completed two huge projects. In this third one, he's not making anything himself, but supporting the others. So it should be an easier gig. So I'm the team leader this week. Mm. So I've been thinking about how my role should be applied. There is a huge amount of talent between us that I was feeling that we can get much more benefit out of um, by hopefully being able to teach each other. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good idea. <laughs> the idea behind all the various collaborations is that the crafters will learn new techniques and understand creativity in a new way, but time is tight. I can't believe it's been two weeks. The first week seems like a month ago. That seems like a lifetime ago. Trying to think about what other things I really want to get from this experience. What other things can we learn from each other and what else can this wonderful house give? 
for Stephen, replicating arts and crafts decorative plates using traditional methods is a real education into the true nature of pottery. But throwing plates on a kick wheel is not easy. I'm really trying to get the form uh, worked out in my head and see if I can get one that looks good. It might take however many attempts until I'm happy with it. And then once that's set, then that's me ready to kind of produce the plates. The technical side of it is going to be as much of an issue and as much of a challenge as actually the design as well. See, I don't want to just see a design, I want to see the technique coming through also. I've never done a plate before. If I can make enough of them, fingers crossed, we can test different things out on a, a couple and then hopefully pick three that work really well because a lot of the time things don't work out, so backups are, are going to be pretty handy. The first hurdle Stephen needs to get over is creating the lip of the plate. It's a steep learning curve. I must have to do the rim thicker. Let's do that one again. Ilsa's been thinking of design ideas, and she's come up with a suggestion she hopes might help Stephen overcome the tricky technical challenges he's facing. I've got an idea that might make your life a bit easier. What if we made smaller plates, smaller portions, yeah. healthier lifestyles? When you're saying having it smaller, do you mean that not the plate smaller, but what if we make the actual serving part of it smaller? That's even better. And then we make the border bigger so then we can fit more... More imagery. More images yeah. on it. But then wouldn't that make your life harder from a making perspective because you've got that overhang yeah. issue? I'll work it out. OK. Rod's come back to the library to begin sketching ideas for his fire dogs. One of the most striking aspects of Jimson's intricate design is the beautiful decorative pierced brasswork. It would have taken two people, a highly experienced blacksmith and a very skilled metal worker to craft this piece. And there's only one Rod. That's the downside to working on your own. I have to rein in some of my slightly more exuberant ideas but at the same time this is a showcase and we want to show some good things so there will be some there'll be some sparks in there and there will be some interesting things I hope. I think Rod was really blown away by these. Absolutely I mean you can't slavishly copy this it would take months to reproduce this they are absolutely magnificent. They are like the holy grail of fire dogs. Bryony and Neve are working on their ideas, next to the very windows where their curtains will hang. That just seems really big. Their first task is to consider the scale of their pattern, and they've turned to the masters for inspiration. So basically, what I've been doing is looking through lots of the Crane and Morris wallpapers and um, tapestries and weavings that you've seen, just trying to work out how pattern is made up. The crucial challenge is to imbue the curtains with the spirit of Walter Crane. Not just a pleasing design, but one with a deeper social meaning. And Neve knows what she wants to do. As soon as I saw the curtains and heard about Crane's sort of political activism, I immediately knew what I wanted to go on the curtains. There's this poem that I've always known called Bread and Roses, which is essentially a socialist poem. And it's the idea that workers need bread, but they also need roses too. So, you know, you need art and love and something extra than just surviving to be happy. There's a line in it which is, hearts starve as well as bodies, give us bread but give us roses. Um, and obviously this is the dining room, so that that whole idea, it just immediately popped out and, and it just immediately sort of fitted in with it. With Neve taking the lead on the concept, it's Bryony's job to make sure their design fits. When we've worked out our design, I'm going to actually be drawing it up 
on a more technical, on, on tracing paper, so it is exactly all matching up on all the corners and that it all is, is proportionately right. To make sure they keep on schedule, they have their very own personal alarm clock. So nice to get, have an injection of sunshine and a bit of a giggle. <laughs> the crafters have now hit their stride. Stephen is finding his rhythm at the potter's wheel. Prise it off that 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 lump of clay. That's it. See how nice it is yeah, when you use a. Well, yeah, it does. Stephen's plan is to make nine plates. So he and Ilsa have spares to practice their designs on. Having done the design for his fire dogs, Rod is beginning work at the nearby Anvil Forge. As a bladesmith, he's experienced at making swords. But he lacks blacksmithing skills so he'll be working with the guidance of Ross Smith. He's probably not far off me, right? Just, uh, it's pretty good. Just wants a bit of chewing up and... Uh... The fire dogs need to withstand the intense heat of burning logs, so they'll be made out of wrought iron. To shape them, Rod will forge the iron bars at temperatures of over 1,000 degrees Celsius. And we're using traditional blacksmithing techniques. We now need to put a, a bend in it, so a right angle bend. If we literally just heated it up and bent it round, it would be fine, it would work, but all of the back of the material would be squeezed down and it wouldn't look good. So what we are doing is we're adding some more material in and then we are doing a right angle bend so the thing is nice and square. The simple iron skeleton will then be connected to the more ornate and decorative front panels. I think what's special about the fire dogs is the quality of the, of the design work. It's the intricacy of the chasing on the front. And it's also, it's, it's wrought iron uh, as well, and wrought is, is particularly difficult to work. The metalwork that Ernest Jimpson produced was not only beautiful, it breathed new life into the traditional skills of blacksmithing and helped to save what was at the time a dying craft. Just need a crisp by outside corner up a little bit. Yep, right there. Yes, you can see you've got an excellent bit of width there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can That's use yeah. that. To, uh, yeah, scratch out. To sharpen it that bit. OK. Tidy that up. OK, good, right? Yeah, that looks like a, a half decent start. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with that. I think it's a good start. I, I'm hopeful that as we do each joint, then um, We'll, we'll, we'll get them right, and um, yeah, yeah, that's a good foundation. It's been just over two weeks since our crafters arrived at the Victorian House of Arts and Crafts. They've fast-tracked friendships and adjusted to living and working together. For all of them, their craft defines who they think they are. So what really drives you to do what you do? Perfectionism, um, ambition, um, focus. Right, okay. the three that, that, that I sort of apply. The reason that I started doing it was because I used to suffer from panic attacks. Oh, okay. And so I use embroidery as a therapeutic tool. I feel like the group dynamics definitely changed. I think that we just now are finally understanding that we're all people. We've all come here, you know, with our own backstories in life and, and everything, and I think everybody is now finally understanding that. They all came to the house as individual crafters. They found that working together can be hard, but rewarding. Yeah. I find collaboration such a great tool for pushing yourself and your art forward. Even us, we, uh, we've been talk, starting to talk about mm. collaborating mm. together in future. Yeah, I've had an idea for you and me, Abby. 
So here's to creativity. With their own projects taking priority, the crafters have had little time to share their knowledge and skills. But having been inspired by the others' stories, Abby is now making it his mission to ensure that they're all able to experience something new during their stay in the house. They end up very tired at the end of the night. <laughs> I'm wide awake. Yeah, you look super awake. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to do something different, but there's not much energy left. So I'm trying to create that space. Abby's plan is for the crafters to all share their expertise with one another. Stephen is the first plucky volunteer. Stephen is going to give us at 8 a.m. a yoga course. So all of us are going to bring our uh, our blankets into the oak room and we hopefully going to be doing a really nice yoga course. The arts and crafts movement championed the importance of stretching the body as well as the mind. Many of its leading lights, including Walter Crane, promoted the health benefits of loose-fitting clothing, especially for women. He hated Victorian stiffness and tightness, and to prove it, illustrated a pamphlet called How to Dress Without the Corset. Take your hand back behind you so we can stretch out the neck. And then just breathe into it and then keep that right shoulder twisted and the chest pointing up. Stretch out the neck. Body and soul back in sync, enthusiasm is renewed. Arms up. Rod, you okay? You're good, man. I think I feel more relaxed, definitely. Uh, I'm ready for the day. Spending these past few weeks in these beautiful surroundings has been a source of inspiration in itself. The creative impulse is one thing, but battling the Welsh elements is another, as Stephen has just found out. Once I finished throwing them, I took the pots outside to actually have a look at them. Uh, and then what I done was I chose the best three and I took them inside to trim them. And I got so kind of caught up with them that I forgot that all my spares and backup pieces were sitting outside in the rain. Now I've just got the three main ones and there's absolutely no uh, room for error right now. Instead of having several plates to practise on, Ilsa will now need to get her design work right first time. It does mean that I have to be super careful in doing the glaze in case I make a mistake and there's no space. Admirably, Stephen and Ilsa are taking this setback on the chin, but Keith doesn't share their lack of concern. Mm. What's going on? <laughs> What's going on? I put them out in a line to pick the three best ones. Right. So I picked yeah. the three best ones yeah. and then I got kind of carried away with that. Rainwater and, and, I, I forgot and to clay them in. is not great. Yeah. yeah. So what have you got then? What, how, many, how many have you got? You've I've got three. OK. Yeah, good luck. Steve, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, he's really up against it now. Um, he's only got three plates left and they're in the kiln now. I really want to see Ilsa be able to, to decorate these plates. That's if there's something to decorate. Spares or not, the next stage is to mix the glazes. It's the same recipe that William de Morgan has. It's this coloured glazed finish that makes de Morgan's ceramics so vibrant and so distinctive. The, the colours in here are really nice. Cause you can see the red iron getting broken up. And uh, it's almost like when you're mixing paint. William de Morgan spent a lifetime perfecting the techniques of his craft. He studied the chemistry of glazes, experimenting with different methods of firing, knowledge that's come down to us today. He had famously high standards. If he didn't like the look of one of his creations, he'd simply smash it into pieces. Stephen doesn't have that luxury. He only has three plates to play with. He really needs to get the glaze right first time round.
Neve and Bryony have nearly finished the design work for the curtains. Now they have the painstaking task of transferring it to graph paper. We've got a long stretch of turning all our design into <laughs> painting all these tiny, tiny, tiny squares one by one. This technical drawing must be absolutely exact, as it's what the mill will use to scale the design up and make the correct amount of fabric. Neve and Bryony, they just seem very calm, cool and collected. And I just love the fact that they're taking their inspiration from this poem. It's that wonderful concept that man or woman does not live by bread alone. I'm really glad that they're working in the Oak Room because they're being constantly reminded of the sheer scale of the project. And I think, you know, they're quietly confident, but, but boy, is there a lot of work still to do. Day number 20 begins, and it's a beauty. May I interrupt? How was breakfast? Lovely, thank you. Mrs Staker has a momentous message for team leader Abby. Drums. <laughs> Dear crafters, Poetry and literature <laughs> was an important part of the recreational life of the arts and craft movement. However, it wasn't all serious. They had a sense of the absurd and liked a bit of silliness. <laughs> <laughs> One of their favorite authors was Edward Lear, yeah. known for his nonsense poems and perhaps most famous for the wonderful the Owl and the Pussycat. Yeah. <laughs> Edward Lear's best-known creation was hugely popular with the Victorians, who loved to stage their own do-it-yourself dramas based on poems and stories. There's some lovely characters in there. There's a turkey that lives on the hill and there's all sorts mm. of pigs and all sorts of things. So there's definitely enough characters for us to play with. In what is already shaping up to be a very busy week, the crafters will need to make time to rehearse their own production of the poem. Abby is working on the soundtrack. But for now, it's back to the day job. Stephen and Ilsa's plates have been glazed with a cobalt blue that's just right for the period. But there's been a gremlin in the works again. Hi, oh, Steve. Oh, Keith. Hey, yeah. You all right? I'm good, man. All oh, right, OK. I must say I had, like, greasy stuff on my fingers, because when I glazed them, the glaze didn't really... That's called crawling. No, that was before it even went in the cone. Oh, OK. Yeah, I must say I, like, touched them with, like, dirty fingers. Right, OK. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Um, you'll definitely need to be aware of greasy fingers yeah. when you come to do the luster work. Yeah. Um, so tell Il Ilsa that. OK. Yeah. yeah. See you in a minute. Bye-bye. With so much work still to be done, the only person with time to rehearse for the upcoming Owl and the Pussycat stage extravaganza is Abby. Lucky is a one-man band. So I made a song for it last night. It has a sense of romanticism and, a, and quite of a rhythmic. So if you can, you like, you can clap with it and, and it has a really good rhythm to it. So it's very exciting. And everybody likes the song, so to the point that everyone was whispering, and said, okay, that's a successful song. <laughs> One of the aims of the arts and crafts movement was to remove the boundaries between high and low art. The others aren't quite sure Abby's succeeded in this aim, but at least he's given it a go. 
Oh, lovely pussy, pussy my love. What a beautiful pussy you are. We were practicing last night. Abby, of course, has to be the owl because he has a guitar. He came up with a version of it and then he repeated it, I don't know, 300 times, something like that. And I was actually trying to do some design work at the time. And after the first 50 times, it was OK. And then after that, I'm thinking, do you know what? I'm going to go find somewhere quiet. So it's gone bizarre. Hey, I love you, pussy, pussy, my love. What a beautiful pussy. Ilsa is now ready to transfer her design onto the Tondino plates. They're blemished and chipped, but she's using the best of her creative skills to salvage the project. The imagery that I've got for this one, the fact that the plate is broken will fit with the story. OK. This one on the far left yeah. is the factory workers. So I'm kind of thinking now, can you see that the, the dogs are biting their own tails? Right. So I might adapt the design so it looks like the dogs have eaten this. Oh, OK. <laughs> With this one, obviously it doesn't have the bump in the middle. I've got a bit of a reason for why that might be in terms of the concept. I've just got to work right. with what's here, haven't I? You so, have really, yeah. 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 It's just yeah. a shame the others were in the rain because we could have had the backups in. Yeah. Well, but there's very little you can do when you're down to three and things yeah. like this happen. Yeah. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> the rain. <laughs> Neither Ilsa nor Stephen have painted plates before, and china painting is a skill that takes years to master. They only have an afternoon. They're hoping some clever design tricks might still save the day. Try and position it so the dog hovers that. But then, hang on, let me see. And then that dog there, mm -hmm. these two. Yeah, make that Or just leave them as they are and just bring their heads up here. To be biting a chunk out of the side. Right, okay. See what I mean? Yes, yeah, so a bit of humour. Okay. Got Sweet. it? Yeah, got it. Sure. In keeping with the style of William de Morgan's ceramics, Stephen and Ilsa are adding luster to their design, literally. These fine films of gold, silver, and red should give the plates a beautiful, shimmering quality. With their design work done, Bryony and Neve are finding out more about the arts and crafts emphasis on nature and sustainability. Many craftspeople were self-sufficient. Their milk and honey on tap. But living in the countryside wasn't just a lifestyle choice. It was also an ideal. The idea of moving out to the country for the arts and crafts people the countryside gave them the cleanliness, the clean air. It gave them the inspiration with flowers and trees. And it was a great place to apply your craft. And it was a great source of inspiration. Bryony and Neve are getting their own taste of the good life. Local beekeeper Gareth Baker has come along to harvest the honey. The one thing about this, it's a pretty exciting time for beekeeping in this, this, this era in that we were sort of on the transition from skep basket beekeeping to frame hives. So, in Victorian terms, that was the latest technology. Look at their little faces. <laughs> With the combs gathered from the hives, it's time to try their hands at extracting the honey, using traditional methods, of course. It's really tiring. <laughs> That's it, that'll do. <gasps> Good afternoon. <laughs> so, how was your day? Good it's afternoon. been good it's so been far. Very thank exciting. you. It's been a really good day. That's our honey. Yes, that's your honey. <laughs> so, thank you very much. There's also pound cake, bread, and potted shrimps, and the larger dish is uh, potted chicken. Wow. Oh, yes. So, enjoy your afternoon tea. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Victorians loved their afternoon tea. For ordinary families, it was often just bread and butter and tea. But for the wealthy, it was an elaborate culinary ritual. Oh, <laughs> that was not posh at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've not had the tea. An important ingredient in any tea party 
was gossip. On today's agenda is final casting for the owl and the pussycat. I'm the owl. <laughs> Stephen is the pussycat. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hilarious. Going to be nuts. <laughs> you be you be the storyteller. Yeah. I think. And uh, so we need a pig. Piggy. And a turkey. And a turkey. Rod is far too busy for afternoon tea. He's finished the first leg of his fire dogs and Keith has come along to inspect the fruits of his labours. The, these are the dogs, so that's the back. I see, yeah. That's there. And this is the big ah, important piece. Wow. OK. Hey. And that goes in there. So that is the main structure of the uh, fire dog. As you see, I've done a little bit of interpretation. Yeah, um, fantastic. Rod's next challenge is to begin work on the decorative design. It's this Pierce work which gives Jimson's fire dogs their distinctive look. It's this that Rod's trying to emulate. Well, Pierce work is basically just cutting holes in things, but it's using a very, very fine blade. It's so thin you can hardly see the teeth. The aspiration of the arts and crafts people was to find joy in their labour. But at the fiddlesome stage of the process, Rod can't find it for love nor money. Oh, I've done it again. So that's the third blade I've broken in the same place, at the same time, without making any cuts at all. Oh! Because there's so much decorative work to do, Rod's trying to speed up the process by cutting two layers of brass at the same time. But his piercing saw is struggling to cope, and so is he. What concerns me, though, is that I'm rapidly running out of blades, and uh, I'm getting through so many blades per inch, there's going to be a point when I'm physically going to have to stop and can't do any more work because I've got no more blades. I'm literally going to run out in... An hour, I think. <sighs> the crafters are all finding out how tough making objects by hand really is. The arts and crafts pioneers did too. And in fact, many items, especially textiles, ended up being manufactured on a larger, more precise scale. Bryony and Neve have come to see for themselves just how much machinery is involved in making their curtains a reality. Oh my god! Here's the back. I'll take it out. Oh, well done! It's so exciting seeing it come round. It's also quite nerve wracking because we know it so well, but I was saying, has the wheat come out as we'd expected? And yep. say, like, the bees are there, and then it rolls a bit more, and else that there. And I can't wait to see it on a grand scale. <laughs> this traditional mill in Suffolk dates back to the arts and crafts era and produced some of William Morris's most famous designs, many of which are still in their archives looked after by textile historian Dominique Kaplan. This is actually an original artwork, similar to the first process that you did. This is all hand-painted, and this is how they started to get a sense for the design that they were going to do. A really lovely example of Beautiful. arts and crafts. They've got this dark background, and then they're keeping the pattern, but also the colours, very organic. Nice. And at the time, Gainsborough was weaving all sorts of qualities, uh, as well as cotton, silk and wool. It's the end of the fifth day, and the crafters are making progress. Rod is pushing forward with his piercing work, and Stephen has delivered the plates to the kiln to go through the final firing process. We've done the best job we can under the time that we've been given. Hopefully folk will appreciate the work that went into it. It's our crafter's final full day. Well, this is sort of the calm before the storm. We've got up 
relatively early. I made everyone breakfast to try and get them prepared for what's going to be a crazy day. So how are we going to work this today? Because there is so much that needs to be done today. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I possibly beg Bryony? I kind of need Bryony and Ilse, if you can spare them. But Stu yeah, said to um... the forge in 15 minutes. Rod began this week excited to be working on his own, but with so much still to be done on his fire dogs, he's had to turn to his fellow crafters for help. I feel happy that Rod has asked me to help him with his project. And in fact, we had a heart to heart last night for a few hours, and we've learned a lot about each other from that. We've had time to maybe talk and um, you know, get to know each other a little better. And I, I think genuinely any, any of our friends would help any, any of the other friends in making their peace. There is actually a joy in sharing it. Right, I think I'm going to need to get to the forge, guys. Have fun. OK, thank you very much. I'll get back as quickly as I possibly can. As Rod's team of helpers settle down to work on the brass piercing, Neve is back in the library trying to finish the curtains on her own. These have to be hemmed, lined, completely up and hanging by tomorrow morning, which is great. And I'm doing it by myself. <laughs> Back at the forge, Rod is completing the iron framework for his fire dogs. This is the second dog, and uh, what we've got to do is attach the tree branches to the second dog. And what we'll do is we'll cut that short, we'll shape it, and then we'll do a scarf joint there. Ross will help me with that because fire welding is uh, his speciality. This blacksmithing technique has been used since the Middle Ages. OK. Fast work. By heating two pieces of iron until they're molten hot, Rod is able to hammer them into one piece. With the decorative twist now forged to the main framework, all that remains to do is to attach it to the feet. One doggy. It stands. It stands. So, yeah, it's nice. Okay, next one. Rod's fire dogs are certainly coming together, but they're a long way from being finished. Bryony is working on the detailed chasing of the metalwork, while Ilsa is still cutting out the patterns. God, these corners are crazy. Ilsa is trying a shortcut. Rod went for delicacy with a tiny saw. Ilsa is employing brute force with a bigger saw at the expense of flexibility with the fiddly bits. Turning the corners is particularly difficult with these bigger blades. You have to be so patient with it and gentle. With only a few hours to go, Bryony has come back to the dining room to help Neve hem the curtains. Yay! When you're doing 10 feet of fabric, it gets a little bit tiring. But not on the turning wrist for some reason, just the pushing wrist. <laughs> but they're on the home stretch. They could be part of the outfits found in the Pussycats. They actually could. We've, we're going to have quite a lot left over now. That's not bad. Nice. Darkness falls, and there's still an awful lot yet to be done. After a week of hard work, the crafters have risen early. We were up fairly late last night finishing them off. There is a lot more that goes into curtain making than any of us realise. There's less than an hour left to get the room looking like an arts and crafts dining room. Four days ago, they, you know, were just an idea in our head. Like, nothing about these curtains existed four days ago. And now, and now they're being hung up. Like, that's amazing. 
and slightly mad. <laughs> Ilsa and Stephen's plates have come back from their final firing at the kiln. The best laid plans. Not the actual hell. Hell's Has that been does it? I don't know. It hasn't stuck. The gold is there, but I can't see the red. Are you sure it, you mix the red properly? 100%. It's a gold one that I'm sure I didn't mix properly. <laughs> well, the gold ones worked, the red ones disappeared. Yeah, that's nuts. They'd been relying on the luster finish to provide that distinctive arts and crafts look. It hasn't. Well, the judges are going to be here shortly, and we're just trying to get the plates clean at least, so maybe the gold can show some of the design and therefore the meaning. But to be honest, the way they look, I'm not pleased to show them. Thanks to the help of his fellow crafters, Rod's fire dogs are finished and ready to be moved into the house. OK, mate, can so, I, would you mind giving me and Brian a hand? The dog's ready, then. All right, let's take for a walk. <sighs> I'm happy as I can be, but it's been a long couple of days. The judges approach. The dining room has been transformed. The crafters have added period furniture to complement their creations. Rod's fire dogs are guarding the hearth. The table is laid with Ilsa and Stephen's plates. And Bryony and Neve's curtains frame the windows. It's now down to Keith and Patch to decide which best captures the spirit of the arts and crafts movement. Where should we begin? Wow. <sighs> wow, the dogs. Cripes. Hey, fantastic. Rod has come up with his own modern take on Jimson's design. You know, I like the interpretation of what, of what, what he's done. Interesting. It's incredible, isn't it? It is. The pierce work is yeah. really... I mean, obviously, you know, to try to bring what Jimson had done in that complicated design, he's simplified it, and I think that's lovely. It's that proportion that really, really works well on them, I think. So, the curtains, wow. Look at that. I love the colour. <laughs> I yes. love that green, the I background green. There's a bit of metallic in there, isn't there? It's got yeah. a bit of yeah. a, you know. It's very modern, with a, you know, their take on it. With arts and crafts twist. Yeah. <laughs> so, should we have a look at the plates? Yeah, let's yeah. have a look. Well, I have to say, with the silver luster on, they're looking a hell of a lot better than they did during the week. This one obviously has had a bit of an yeah. accident. For me, I yeah, for the back. Me too. <laughs> I'm with you there, great. They're fantastic. That looks great. Doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so we have to decide. I think it's hard this week. It is difficult. I mean, I'm not set yet. No, me neither. What are we judging this on? Well, we're judging it on the arts and crafts ethos, sure, but we're also judging it on the craftsmanship that they've had to extol during that week. Yeah. It's a tough one, isn't it? It is a tough one. It's really difficult. The objects are the result of the crafters' creativity, determination and hard work. All that now hangs in the balance. I think we've made a decision. I think so. Yeah, Should yeah. we get them in? Yeah. OK, let's do it. Hello, gang. Hello. Hiya. Come and join us. Oh, smiles on their faces. <laughs> That's good. I don't know why. <laughs> First up are Rod's fire dogs. I think that you've really captured a spirit within that. I mean, I think they've got great proportion. I think the, the raw time work is superb. I love the way it comes through. What lets it down for me is the finish. There's little elements within there that when you touch it, it's very sharp. It's not beautifully beveled. I know it's we a ran huge out of time. task. We it's ran a out of time. huge task. Mm. We could have spent another week or two weeks on it and we still wouldn't have had it finished, of course. Um, yeah. to be honest. It's just 
very, very laborious. And who, who helped? Oh, uh, Ilsa helped and Steve helped and Bryony very much helped. And Abba, uh, Abby kept us all um, amused. <laughs> they, yeah. ha they have power. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, they really do have power, yeah. Elsa and Stephen. Your Tondino bowls. Elsa's grimacing a bit. Come though. on, Elsa, let so it come out. Come on, yeah. Well, for me, the week was a lot of fun. Working with Stephen was lovely. It was difficult at times. We had a few accidents, didn't we, along the way? It hasn't worked out the way we wanted it to. The design work yeah. is great and the concept is good. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, it, it's a shame that it didn't come to fruition. And Stephen and I generated that together as okay, well. Brilliant. Yeah, well, well done. done. Well done, well done. Well done. Excellent. Neve and Bryony. Little girl gang. <laughs> um, uh, talk to us about these gorgeous curtains. I mean, it's, it's worth saying that Bryony and I have never done anything like this. Not the designing, not the making of the curtains, absolutely none of it. But we did it. But we did it, yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know, the proportion of, of, of the curtains is fantastic. You know, you've met the brief brilliantly, and I think they sit in this room like they've been here forever. Right, so we had a really tough decision this week uh, to pick the item that we thought would best reflect the arts and crafts ethos. The item of the week this week... Rod, your firebox. Ooh, well done. <laughs> And so, as the sun sets on the final day of week three, the crafters can swap their saws for song sheets, ready for the world premiere of their spectacular, no expense spared rendition of that much loved Victorian classic, The Owl and the Pussycat. <laughs> I don't think we're disappointed at all that we didn't win. You know, they said some brilliant things about our curtains, about our design, and that's what's important, you know, that's what matters. I'm glad that we just had the chance to work together, had the chance to do something that we'd never done before. Yeah. That was ace. It was brilliant. Oh, yeah. Pussy, my love, what a wonderful pussy you are. All I love is pussy, my love, what a wonderful I, I wanted my piece to be appreciated, which it was, so yes, that was very emotional, that was, that was very good. But, but no, probably more so, I think, would be um, the friendships that we've created. You are, you are, you are, you are.